Well, welcome to this afternoon's or today's uh, SingHealth Duke and US Global Health Institute webinar. My name is uh, John Lim. I'm the core policy lead at uh, SDGHI, as well as executive director at the Duke and US Center of Regulatory Excellence. And we're delighted to have all of you join us and our distinguished panelists today. Just to uh, give some background on SDGHI, this was established in 2018 uh, within our academic medical center and the vision and mission, as you can see on the screen, uh, focusing on Asia and the region to address pressing global health challenges and also importantly to develop future global health leaders. There are five core areas of focus within the Institute uh, and today's uh, webinar is hosted by the policy core on the left which as you can see is aimed at developing health policy excellence, but also generating awareness of important global health issues. And the goals of the policy core are to function as a reference center for policy solutions, to work with government's policy making, to provide a platform for dialogue amongst key stakeholders. And specific to today's webinar are the third and fourth points to increase awareness of policymakers of the utility of a structured method to present policy solutions, and also to increase awareness and competency in the use of policy analysis and policy research and implementation. So ultimately, what our policy core aims to do is to create a community of practice. So in that sense, you're all members of this community today as we come together. Uh, as we look into policy research analysis implementation and really we're aiming to engage with stakeholders in the very important mission of addressing health inequities through evidence-based policy solutions so for today's webinar uh, we have four uh, speakers and the program covers these four areas you see on the screen and as the name suggests this is really an introduction to the whole area of policy analysis and we also have a case study as part of this. We are delighted that we have four very distinguished speakers who will be following on from me. Firstly, Dr. Ayat Abu Agla, uh, then Professor Taufik Jorda. The main talk will be given by Professor Lucy Gilson, and the case study will be presented by Dr. Aoyong Lai Meng. Uh, so I will not go further in the interest of time, but you can read their background, and I'm sure you can see that they're all highly equipped and qualified to follow through in terms of what we're addressing today. So without any further ado, I would like to hand the time over to Dr. Ayat Abu Agla to touch on the first topic and contextualize what we're discussing today. So with that, uh, over to you, Ayat. Thank you, John. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for all those joining. Uh, my name is Ayata Bo Agla, and I co-chair the thematic working group on teaching and learning of the health systems global. So uh, our group is organized around ways to improve the teaching and learning of health policy and systems research, since this is a period of growth of the field with innovations and new developments in a wide variety of health policy and system research methods and application. We feel that there is pressing need to better define the field of HPSR and improve the capabilities of teaching institutions, teachers to teach and apply HPSR and to keep up with these new developments, as well as the increasing demand for qualified HPSR trainers, practitioners by governments, public health, clinical, and other organizations within the uh, the system. Next slide, please. Um, so our group, as I mentioned, focus on ways to improve the teaching and learning of health policy and systems research with emphasis on applications in low and middle income countries and disadvantaged population. Next. So in providing that, our objective is to provide an interdisciplinary forum for our students, for our educators, administrators, and those interested in teaching and learning uh, to collaborate and share information, hence our webinar for the day, and to increase the educational approaches, curricular development, and materials and methods in the area of health policy and systems in order also to respond to the capacity building issues in relation to the field. Next. 
And in doing so, we have a variety of activities, naming a few, hosting webinars, workshops, regional activities, and meetings at global events. Uh, this webinar and a series of other webinars will be conducted, and hopefully you'll be engaging with us throughout the process. And also, our te a thematic working group hosts and develop the HPSR training database to maintain the materials on teaching and learning within the field. Next. And as you can see here, this was one of our activities last year conducted to update the database. And uh, thank you to all those who joined, uh, whether it was the survey, whether it was our online or in-person discussions to be launched soon. Next. So uh, I co-chair this together with my colleague, uh, Gina Teddy from Ghana. Next and uh, a list of steering committee members who includes uh, Lucy, um, which will be uh, our main speaker for this webinar. Next slide, please. And uh, at the end, uh, before handing it over to Tofik, we'd like you to save the date, our upcoming uh, symposium, eighth global symposium, which will be held in Nagasaki, Japan. So uh, stay tuned to updates and we look forward for your participation. So I'd like to hand it over to John and wish you all a very fruitful and productive webinar for the day. Thank you, John. Thank you, Aya. Actually, I'm handing the time over to Tofik now who will uh, speak next. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Tofik Jordar. Uh, I welcome everyone to this um, uh, webinar, this session on uh, policy analysis. This is the first such webinar uh, organized collaboratively by Sing Health UK and US Global Health Institute and Health Systems Global, uh, which I have the privilege of being part of um, both of these organizations. So uh, my name is Tofik Jordan, as I said. Uh, so first, I mean, since I belong to both of these organizations, first I'd like to uh, share a few um, contextual information about both these organizations before going into um, uh, the policy related discussion that we have and serve as a bridge between um, the rest of the sessions and uh, Professor Lucy Gilson's policy um, keynote speech. So Sing Health Duke and US Global Health Institute has five uh, pillars as John mentioned, and there are six enabling platforms, including um, outbreak preparedness, leadership and management, implementation science, and so on and so forth. And, and if you look at this, um, this slide, this map clearly shows that the concentration of most of our projects are actually in South Asia and Southeast Asia region, um, largely Asia Pacific region. Now I go to uh, the Health Systems Global slides. So Health System Global is a society driven by uh, diverse global membership that connects the health system research policy and practice communities. And there are um, thematic working groups um, on different topics. So you, if you, I mean, we welcome you to become a member of Health Systems Global, but even if you are not, not a member, but share interest on certain um, health systems topics, you can always participate in uh, the, these thematic working groups, such as social science issues in, um, in health systems, fragile and conflict affected settings, planetary health, teaching and learning, and so and so forth. In addition to these uh, thematic working groups, there are regional networks. Um, there are um, such as, I mean, these regional networks are aligned with the WHO, um, seven WHO uh, regions, and we belong to uh, the Western Pacific region. But traditionally, we work very closely with uh, Southeast Asia region, which we uh, collectively called uh, call uh, the Asia Pacific uh, Regional Network. I shared this uh, network with my colleague uh, Pragati Heber from Southeast Asia region who contributed um, to this uh, webinar as well. Um, and she's uh, actually present um, on the background. We have, I mean, the Health System Global has several capacity strengthening activities. And finally, it has a global symposia, which uh, Ayat also shared and I'll um, 
show a slide on that as well. So if you want to be a member, um, I mean, I'm not going into the detail of this slide, just try, going to uh, show you the links where which you can actually click and become a member of the Health System Global or thematic working groups or participate um, in the regional networks or register for the conference. The conference is on, uh, and my colleague um, uh, Jung is uh, sharing uh, the links. If you want, you can actually uh, explore those links during the webinar as well. Um, this, uh, interestingly, this um, the next uh, health systems conference is, is, is actually one of the largest um, global health conference uh, conferences, and uh, this time it's, it's going to take place in the Western Pacific region in Nagasaki, Japan from um, 18 to 22, 22nd November. And the symposium team is very much aligned with um, a lot of work that our colleagues do in Singapore around uh, patient-centered care, planetary health, um, health policy and health systems research, health service related topics um, um, that, that are actually covered by um, this symposium. And usually um, it attracts participants from around the globe. Usually the number ranges between uh, 1800 to 2500. So it's actually a reasonably large conference uh, for you to explore um, in November next year. So now uh, let's go to the policy part. So this is actually the formal definition of policy. Since we are going to talk about the policy analysis, some may ask what is actually a public policy? So it's actually a set of decisions taken through a process of decision making by people of influence uh, in a particular area and they uh, propose a course of action as well. But it's, it is important to understand that it's, it's just the surface. Um, this, this definition is just surface of the policy. But we need to, I mean, as analysts, we need to even uh, think of the things that are not in the policy. And we need to ask why these decisions or these policies are not included uh, or not um, discussed within the policy circle. What's the matter? Is it uh, deliberate? Um, uh, omission? Is it because of the lack of knowledge or lack of evidence? So these are the questions that policy analysts um, ask going beyond the traditional rationalist approach. So rationalist approach of policy analy analysis is relatively known because it's a traditional approach um, of policy analysis, assuming that the decision makers um, have the full and perfect information on which to base their choice uh, regarding the policies. They have the measurable criteria, uh, and the data uh, which they can collect and analyze to decide on a certain policy. Another big assumption is that these decision makers have the cognitive ability, time and resources to ev evaluate each alternative against the other. So as much as we want this to be true, these assumptions to be true, but this is not the case in many countries. Uh, in fact, in most of the countries, especially in low and middle income countries, you know, uh, where uh, we as global health uh, professionals tend to work a lot. Health policy uh, is is highly uh, political. I mean, it's uh, health policy is political because the policies and reforms reflect political philosophy, not philosophies, not just the evidence that are there. For example, if you look at the um, abortion law in the U.S., it largely depends on who is in in the power at that time. You know, when these laws are being discussed or being promulgated. Um, it, it depends. Policies and reforms depend on uh, the allocation of benefits and costs. Who gets what? and who gets the benefit and who bears the burden of these. These are some political issues that, um, that determine the policy adoption um, uh, as opposed to just um, bare bone evidence. Sometimes um, these policies and reforms are associated with political events of, or crisis. For example, look at uh, COVID-19. We uh, knew about vaccine equity, pandemic preparedness, health security for many years, but until a massive um, event like a pandemic hit, we did not care much about um, uh, moving towards those uh, those policies or acting on those policies. Policies and reforms can affect the stability of the government uh, long, or longevity of the government. I'm, I come from Bangladesh, for example. If you want to, I mean, a government um, wants to implement sugar taxation there, it may even topple the government because it's going to make the government hugely unpopular well, where uh, sweet is a part and parcel of our culture. Every event is starting from um, a baby is born or somebody passed an exam or got a job or got married, uh, you need to take sweets as a, as a treat, Roshogulla, I mean, Bengali, famous Bengali uh, sweet. Um, and nobody will actually um, uh, welcome uh, the, uh, the, the increase of price of uh, this product. So although we know that 
it is a best buy to uh, implement, I mean, increase the tax on uh, on sugar. Uh, it's, it's a good thing uh, from public health perspective, but it's a political choice to make uh, by the government, right? So, so there are, I mean, what I'm trying to get at is that, uh, I mean, in addition to the rational approach of uh, policy analysis, there are other approaches, including the political economy uh, approach, uh, and there are different uh, frameworks that are used to uh, analyze the retrospective and prospective, uh, I mean, analyze the policies retrospectively or prospectively, which I believe uh, Professor Lucy Gilson will describe more in detail. If you look at the history of uh, policy analysis, you'll notice that during the 1950s and 1960s, most of the discussions, especially in the US, were around uh, gathering information and designing the policies, which is more aligned with the um, rationalistic approach of uh, policy analysis. But in 1970s and 1960s and 70s, the policy scientists started soul searching. I mean, what are the disagreements? Why were there are value conflicts? Why some informations are there but not used? Um, and all sorts of things. And after 1970s, basically new understanding around policy analysis started to emerge, uh, which are more aligned with uh, the political economy um, analysis of um, uh, of the policies. So it's, it's not, uh, I mean, I'm not trying to say that uh, rationalistic approach is not good or it's not uh, useful, but it's also important to understand that any policy decision involves contestation, resistance, and negotiation, which essentially leads to uh, its political nature. So when we are thinking about policy or policy decision making or analyzing a policy, we need to be mindful of the fact that is political and without addressing the political landscape or political context is, is I mean, any analysis of policy will remain incomplete. With this, I end and I request my um, teacher, my mentor, Professor uh, Lucy Gilson to take over and uh, delve deeper into the issues of policy analysis. Lucy. Thank you very much, Tafik. Let me just share my slides uh, and um, Good morning, everybody from Cape Town, South Africa, which is where I'm based. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So what I want to do in this brief introduction to health policy analysis is share a few starting points and then offer some ideas of the many theoretical frameworks available, as well as give a couple of analytic examples. So what are the starting points? And here I'm going to uh, build where Tofik left off. So this is the core definition of health policy in the type of policy analysis that we're talking about this morning. It's about process and power, and it's concerned with who influences whom in the making of policy and how that happens. Given that definition, we can then think of health policy analysis as being uh, focused on understanding the interacting factors that influence how policy change evolves over time. And the uh, policy analysis triangle in the bottom right corner reminds us that we can always think about the actors involved, the contextual factors, the design details, and the processes of developing and implementing policies. Now, as Tofik said, this form of policy analysis can be used to look backwards. We can analyze past experience. But it's really important that we also recognize that it is useful for policy. It can support current and future policy processes. To give some examples of the applications of prospective policy analysis, it can be used to think about actor power and uh, dynamics in policy change processes and to think about how to manage those dynamics. It can be used to support the development of advocacy strategies, whether it's advocacy for a problem to be recognized in policy or for a particular policy to be recognized as a good choice. It's also helpful and can be used to think about how evidence can be better used in policy formulation. And lastly, it's a really useful approach for thinking about the forms and practices of health system leadership that are necessary and important in strengthening policy implementation. So with those starting points, I want to turn next to think a little bit about a particular area of policy change that is known as agenda setting. 
Many would argue that the agenda setting element of a policy process is really critical because it sets the scene for other steps in the process. So what is agenda setting? It is essentially a process of political prioritization. There are many potential problems and issues that need uh, policy attention in the world around us, but not all of them get that attention. So agenda setting asks the question, why do some policy issues gain attention to the extent that action is likely to be taken? Now, this is an area of policy analysis where there's a lot of theory that we can draw on better to understand the things that are happening. And here I just list three theorists and their theory, Hall, Kingdom, and Schiffman and Smith, who work in global health. Um, Kingdon's theory is perhaps the most widely used theoretical frame in understanding agenda setting uh, in health policy in low and middle income countries. And I want to speak to particularly to Kingdon, although the other theories offer similar ideas just put together in slightly different ways. So Kingdon suggests that windows of opportunity for agenda setting arise when policy problems, policy solutions, and political support come together. And he sees those three areas of activity, problems, solutions, and political support, as parallel streams that are ongoing in the world around us all the time. And a window of opportunity arises when they come together, perhaps because there's a particular crisis that focuses attention on a problem, or perhaps because there's a policy entrepreneur who can join the streams together. Or perhaps there's a political moment, such as an election, that brings attention to the need uh, for a policy action. So Kingdon's agenda setting framework is very widely used and it's reflected in Shipman and Smith, for example. But as Taufik said, we also need to ask why some problems uh, or reforms are ignored or blocked and this is the terrain of non-decision making. And I want to use here one example of a published so, uh, study to think about non-decision making. And it looked at um, health financing reforms in Malaysia over a 35 year period. And it asked the question, why were reforms towards a social health insurance continually proposed by the government, but consistently blocked? And in its analysis, it explored three theoretical lenses. The first was the possibility that within the political system, there were many veto points where the policy could be blocked at many places. But the, um, the analysis suggests that wasn't relevant given the nature of the political system in Malaysia. The second potential explanation was the opposition of interest groups and interest group opposition is part of every policy process. But there was relatively weak opposition to these reforms, and so it wasn't judged to be the decisive factor, although certainly a factor. Instead, the core explanation of the lack of decision making was policymakers' concerns that the public would resist new reforms because they were satisfied with the financing system in place. And they were concerned that public backlash would, uh, would lead to political, uh, political risks with respect to taking forward the reform. And so, although they wanted the reform themselves, they continued to withdraw from the final act of trying to bring about change. So as Taufik said, it's really important to, to think about non-decision making. And this article gives us some insights into that in one particular setting. I want now to turn to policy implementation. This is often thought to be a fairly technical and rational process, um, but it's important to understand that implementation is itself contested and a, a, a complex process. The cartoon on this slide reminds us that in many countries, as in South Africa, where it came from, there are lots of great policy documents, but they sit on shelves. They don't get implemented. Implementation is simply a one-legged duck. Now, the theory that can help us understand implementation is drawn from many different disciplinary perspectives. But in policy analysis, our core question is something like, 
what factors influence the collective action that's required to implement policy. And we recognize that implementation requires chains of actors working together, and that's what collective action is needed. One body of theory, top-down theory, rooted in quite a rationalist perspective, suggests that implementation can be pre-planned and controlled by the central planners who develop the policies. And one theoretical frame offers nine conditions for perfect implement implementation. But those nine conditions are actually very difficult to, uh, to uh, meet in practice. And in the real world, in practice around us, we can see signs of the difficulties of a top-down approach. Those signs include where central targets for plans are set or for policies are set, they're just not met. Policies are implemented and have unexpected and often unwanted effects. There are tensions between some of the actors involved in the chains of implementation, particularly senior managers and implementers. And at the same time, those at the front line of implementation may well introduce unexpected innovations to support policy goals and achieve public benefit. So these signs of the challenges of top-down implementation lead us to the other terrain of implementation theory, which is very diverse and wide ranging. But this bottom-up theory sees implementation as always a process of interaction and negotiation where contestation is common. And it involves those trying to put policy into effect and those on whom that action depends. And those actors include in the health system frontline providers, um, but they could also include frontline uh, workers in other sectors where we're doing a work that crosses sectors and they certainly would include patients and populations. Now, one particular theory within the bottom up uh, um, domain is called street level bureaucracy. And this, this theory uh, highlights that in reality, at the front line, the street level bureaucrats responsible for implementing policy have discretionary power. They aren't robots, so they can't simply be told what to do. So they use that power, they exercise that power as they seek to implement policies and the translation of policy into practice becomes the policy as experienced by beneficiaries. And that may be different, the practice may be different from the policy as written in documents. And so it is the practice that if you like, becomes the policy rather than the policy as written in the document. The third element of street level bureaucracy theory points attention to the bureaucratic context in which street level bureaucrats work and that influences whether or not and how they practice power. This theory suggests that the street level bureaucrats may sometimes use their power to resist policy change, to avoid it, to ignore it, or to translate it in ways that were not intended. But as I've already noted, they may also use their power to support the achievement of goals and to offer benefit to policy beneficiaries. But the key thing is they do have power and they do translate policy in practice. So what are the managerial implications of top-down and bottom-up theory? Because as I said, the analysis of policy process allows us to generate recommendations to guide future processes. Well, top-down theory suggests we should issue guidance, plan, incentivize, hold the front line to account. But the bottom-up theory says it's important that we recognize the experiential knowledge of those at the front line, that we draw on that knowledge as we develop and design policies as we seek to implement them. It's important that we delegate power and acknowledge their power, but uh, uh, create frameworks within which they exercise that power, that we build relationships amongst them and that there is mutual accountability between the top and the bottom. So implementation theory offers perhaps different recommendations and we can learn from both sets of theory. I want also to turn to a published example of implementation work, 
um, that looked at the implementation of an indigenous people's health policy in the Philippines. Um, and this policy was intended to support equity of access and culturally sensitive services. And the study specifically examined how um, subnational health managers, so not the central planners, but those lower down the system, exercised power uh, in the implementation of policy and with what consequences. This slide presents the, the uh, diagram that summarizes the findings of the study. And on the right hand side in the yellow box, you can see that the consequences of the way power was practiced was, was that, were that the policy itself was simply weakly integrated into existing programs. It intended to improve those programs, but it didn't achieve those goals because it was not well integrated. And the analysis um, draws attention to the chains of implementing actors involved in this uh, particular policy and the ways in which they exercised power. And in the first instance, it recognizes how their organizational context drove their actions. So they were more concerned in the centrally set targets that didn't include the indigenous people's policy. And they also implemented the policy as a vertical program when it was intended to be integrated with other policies. The study also found that program managers lower down the system who were themselves indigenous were more likely to support the implementation of this policy, but often felt unconfident in engaging in the policy process. And again, were driven by this organizational context that pushed them to do things that led the policy to be weakly integrated into existing programs. So finally, why does this sort of policy analysis matter for all of us wherever we sit in a health system? I'd argue it matters because health systems are part of the fabric of every society. Health policy implemented and translated through those systems affects all of us. Policy analysis, this type of policy analysis, can help us see the power we have to engage with an influence policy so that we can use that power better to support the achievement of public good. I hope this brief taster of policy analysis theories and approaches um, has whet your appetite, and I'd like to turn it over now to the next speaker who will give you a more uh, fleshed out example. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good day, everyone, I should say. My name is Lai Ming, and I'm a medical social worker by training. Uh, I'd like to first of all thank the organizing committee uh, for this invite to present our research study on the policy analysis of uh, war on diabetes. Essentially, you know, this case study will be an illustration of how we use a policy analysis framework in order to look at the war on diabetes as a policy that was being implemented in Singapore in uh, 2016. So as we all know that you know diabetes is a problem, is a growing problem, you know, across the world. And in Singapore, you know, we know that 440,000 Singaporeans had diabetes in 2014, and we would expect the number to increase to 1 million by 2050. We know also, you know, that diabetes can cause uh, multiple complications, you know, and that could include stroke, uh, heart attack, amputation, and blindness as well. It's got an increasing uh, economic cost, you know, sort of. Uh, 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 kind of implication on the working age adults in Singapore, uh, which is expected or projected to increase over the years. And in fact, Singapore is the second country after Pakistan globally with the highest proportion of death uh, under the age of 60 among those with diabetes. And diabetes, you know, as compared to aging, and we know that, you know, um, Singapore, in, in this case, Singapore, you know, a, uh, aging is, is, is a problem, you know, but the projected diabetes burden in Singapore is expected to increase at a much faster pace than aging. Uh, itself. So we know that the, the World Health Organization, you know, in 2016, released a global report on diabetes and had called for a whole of government and whole of society approach. And what this essentially means is that uh, countries, you know, are, are to systematically uh, 
see the you know uh, the health implications uh, across policies you know in sectors such as housing, education, you know, and transport as well. Uh, it also mean adopting a life cost perspective and multi sectoral and population based uh, approach, you know, to address the problem and to also consider uh, you know the commercial deter the determinants of health you know involved in um, diabetes management and prevention as well. And this would mean working with the multinational or transnational corporations who are seen to be the major drivers of non-communicable disease, diseases, uh, and that includes diabetes as well. The Singapore Ministry of Health uh, in tandem you know, declared war on diabetes in April 2016. Now, however, we, we don't really know as to how the, the policy has been uh, positioned you know, to bring about changes and what the uh, policy actors perceive challenges are. We don't really know, you know the political, economic, infrastructural and ideational constructivist, constructivist uh, context in influencing this policy. So this study aims to narrow this knowledge gap, you know, by using the policy triangle framework, you know, alluded by uh, Prof um, uh, earlier, uh, uh, and and essentially, you know, I, I should credit her, uh, Prof Jewson, you know, uh, and her colleague, uh, Prof Walt, in designing, you know, and introducing, you know, this framework in 1994. Uh, in this case, you know, for us to analyze the war on diabetes uh, policy response. So this framework is relevant because it's beyond understanding that the policy is a product of and constructed through. Uh, political and social processes, and we have framed our method uh, in such a way that you consider the political institutions and public bureaucracies. Uh, you also consider, you know, the influence of non-state actors, uh, such as the general public as well. So uh, as what was presented earlier, the policy triangle framework, you know, consists of four key domains, it includes, you know, uh, context, actors, uh, content, and process. So for the purpose of study, we ask questions, you know, such as, you know, what is the social, economic, political and health system context of this policy, who the key actors are, uh, what the objectives of this policy are, and that we include, you know, the thematic areas to be addressed, you know, the instruments used and the parameters that have been put in place. We also ask the question, you know, what are the challenges uh, in the implementing of this policy? And that could involve uh, areas such as cost, technical visibility, acceptability among uh, target populations as well. So uh, for our research, we interviewed uh, 31 um, uh, policy actors, you know, and these 31 policy actors are senior leaders, you know, such as CEOs, presidents, general managers, uh, professors or directors you know, in their organization, or they could be actors in or close observers, you know, of the war on diabetes. Uh, there are five clusters of respondents. You know, the first cluster includes, you know, the government officials, uh, followed by healthcare providers, the FMB enterprises, and by FMB enterprises, we are referring to the entire continuum, including you know, the small and medium enterprises right up to the multinational corporations. Uh, and of course, they could be uh, situated you know, in any way of the continuum. You know, they could be the innovators, they could be manufacturers of FMB, they could be producers or the retailers as well. We also interviewed you know, respondents uh, from the professional associations, you know, such as the Food Manufacturing Association, uh, Diabetes Association, National Nutrition and Dietetics Association. And of course, we interviewed you know, the uh, academic institutions, think tanks, reps as well, you know, from National University of Singapore, for example. And we had uh, the general public, including people with without diabetes and their caregivers as well. We, as part of this uh, research, we also looked at uh, organizational documents and organizational documents are relevant because they constitute a form of a social materiality of how the policy was implemented, you know, and such organizational documents include, you know, things like press releases, organizational archives, YouTube videos, newspaper reports, and opinion editorials. We have designed topic guides uh, to guide us, you know, through the interview process as well. So what our findings uh, have shown, you know, in terms of context, you know, is that uh, most of respondents were very clear in terms of the reasons, you know, for the war on diabetes, you know, and they, in fact, attributed, you know, the reasons, you know, uh, to have created, you know, the sort of moral impetus for our government to not just people, you know, to change their lifestyle. You know, some of the reasons for war on diabetes, you know, would include the rising prevalence of diabetes, you know, aging population, and the rising healthcare costs in Singapore. Our respondents were pretty clear in terms of the causes of diabetes as well. I would say most of them, you know, they were able to appreciate that uh, the complex interaction of economic, social, cultural, individual, national and, and environmental factors, and they could include the access to unhealthy food, affluence of society, uh, the role of culture, family and personal choices, invincibility syndrome, and health literacy as well. 
So this slide shows you know, the actors we interviewed. You know, the primary goal of this slide is to highlight you know, that in interviewing the policy elites, uh, we were very careful in selecting you know, our respondents. By careful, we mean that we, are, we tried to be as holistic as possible. Uh, we interviewed those who uh, were operating through, you know, look, were, were looking at the epidemiology and disease control division in the Ministry of Health. Uh, we interviewed representatives from the Health Promotion Board, you know, and includes people in you know, division or departments of obesity, prevention management division, healthy aging, uh, marketing, preventive and health and healthy lifestyle, and corporate and industry partnership as well. Uh, we should also uh, mention you know, that uh, we interviewed respondents from the MOH Diabetes Prevention and Care Task Force. Uh, essentially, uh, it's, a, it's a task force uh, set up you know, to facilitate and coordinate the involvement of the various policy actors. So in terms of content, you know, when we looked at the, uh, uh, the materials, the organizational materials and triangulate that, you know, with the uh, interview materials, we found that the government you know, had actually engaged multiple policy actors and, you know, such as through public forums and engagement uh, in order to deliver a slew of measures, different time points uh, following the policy declaration. Uh, it was kind of clear as well, you know, that policy core of the war on diabetes are centered primarily on the improving uh, the population's physical activity, quality and quantity of dietary intake, uh, screening uptake, and intervention uh, to control diabetes as well. How did the government, government do it? You know, government actually actively used words, uh, images, and symbols. Some of you, you know, might be familiar with you know, those on the right-hand column of this slide uh, to form meaning coalitions you know, with different policy actors. Uh, you know, it could be through the use of uh, various languages as well, such as dialects and vernacular languages uh, to address the different segments of the population, including the older adults as well. The Ministry of Health, you know, in this case, had also put in place systems to foster healthier lifestyles. You know, it engaged uh, employees in the workplace, and partnered uh, with the F&B industry to support major drinks companies and uh, other F&B companies to undertake innovation to lower sugar content in their products. One good example, as we see here, you know, is the seven companies uh, that were engaged in as part of this 2017 Industry Act, a pact. And you know, this uh, seven companies include Coca-Cola, F&N Foods. Malaysia Dairy Industries, uh, Nestle, PepsiCo, Pokka, and Yo Hyap Singh. Uh, the government also explored legal parameters, and you know, through public consultation for you know, in, in uh, December 2018, right up to January 2019, to look at various areas, you know, such as introducing mandatory uh, front of pack nutrient summary label and other you know sort of uh, parameters as well. It's important, you know, to um, highlight, you know, that. These proposed measures, especially those related to legal parameters, were rolled out, you know, uh, in 2020, you know, uh, gradually, and that came nearly three years after the declaration of the war on diabetes. Uh, what this suggests to us is that the government had spent, you know, the kind of time and effort to set the stage to create this environment, you know, for the people, for, for the various policy actors, uh, to work together, you know, to create this environment for people to lead a healthier lifestyle. And what was subliminal, you know, was really the engagement of the FMB industry, as what I mentioned earlier, uh, taking them head on uh, in a fairly collaborative, interactive uh, approach uh, to support them in their endeavor. The government, you know, three in, three in, in November 2019, uh, went on to introduce the patient uh, empowerment for self care framework, and that was. Uh, and the first tranche of materials, you know, was uh, uh, was essentially you know introduced at that point of time, and that was nearly three years after the dec declaration of the policy. So, in terms of uh, processes, you know, in, 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 in this war on diabetes, you know, uh, while many of our respondents, you know, uh, were agreeable, you know, and shared that the war on diabetes served as a useful policy frame to galvanize government action and whole of society action and attention. They were fairly honest in stating, you know, that the entire landscape, you know, was brought with challenges. Uh, there were also competing views, you know, con uh, you know among non-policy elites as well. So, for example, you know, many respondents, the non-policy elite uh, actors, I, I should say, uh, questioned, you know, why war against diabetes, you know, because in the process of uh, uh, waging war against diabetes, it could be perceived as perpetuating you know, a stigma towards uh, those with diabetes. Many uh, suggested that perhaps a war against a sedentary lifestyle could be more appropriate. Uh, we had also respondents who asked why sugar, you know, when sugar is so innocent, right, in, in, in that sense. And they felt that, in fact, you know, uh, we should be looking at nutrients as, as a whole. Uh, uh, still, you know, there were also others who asked why sugar sweetened beverages, you know, when in fact the biggest culprit could be food. 
Many respondents also asked who is the policy for. Uh, some assumed that the policy is for the general public, you know, uh, but at the same time admitted that there was a lack of clarity on the target audience. Uh, there was another group, you know, that assumed that policy was for the general public by excluding those with diabetes. So effectively for the well or at risk. Uh, uh, and, and you know, this group of respondents, you know, highlighted that you know, doing so. Margin marginalizing those with diabetes, and they genuinely felt that the diabetes you know, does not speak directly to them or address the, or, or, or their needs. You know, those with diabetes, uh, in terms of treatment costs, the cost of consumables and related devices. There was also a group of respondents uh, who shared that the, di the word diabetes is effectively you know, for those with uh, the time to be engaged in the programs and schemes such as the retirees. Most of respondents, you know, reported there was a barrage of messages, you know, in relation to one diabetes, you know, which they found conflicting and confusing at that point of time. They also shared, you know, that uh, many of the images, you know, symbols that we use were unclear uh, to some extent in their representation. Uh, they felt that, you know, there was a need to promptly, you know, clarify fake news uh, and to address, you know, uh, popular commercial diet fats, you know, and to provide really consistent advice uh, in this regard, you know, which was found to be fairly lacking uh, in the environment. Some respondents also highlighted the need to regulate uh, healthcare services provided through online apps and virtual coaching programs. Uh, many of these respondents asked as to whether you know, those on the other side you know, providing such professional programs uh, were well qualified or otherwise. So in terms of uh, processes, you know, um, and among, you know, our FMB industry respondents, many highlighted high innovation, production and marketing costs as the primary concern and challenge that they faced in formulating and reformulating uh, FMB products, you know, that would be healthier. They also highlighted, you know, that at the point of time, in the, since the introduction of the policy, the taste acceptance for newer and healthier FMB products uh, might not come immediately. They also reported, you know, that FMB retailers, you know, who are driven by profits, may not be too quick uh, to offer and you know, to place you know, such uh, products on their shelves, uh, as they are profit sensitive in that sense. Still, there were also many uh, FMB respondents highlighted, you know, that the healthier FMB products must have reached beyond the local market because you know, the domestic market in Singapore is fairly small, and that would require harmonization of the, of, of the accreditation of healthier products across countries. And I suppose here's where global health comes in. Uh, there's also a need to foster government to government and business to business uh, collaborations. We also found that smaller FMB manufacturers and outlets, you know, such as SMEs, reported multiple acute cash flow issues due to a range of factors such as labor costs and high rental uh, uh, rentals uh, fees as well. What we found as well is that you know FMB retailers, you know, the larger ones especially, such as supermarkets, you know, food establishments, uh, including restaurants, um, were least hit by the policy. So one could see that they were better resourced and better able, you know, to provide uh, and offer you know wider ranging FMB products. You know, they were. Um, uh, you know, they, they were driven, you know, by the demand, you know, for healthier products as well. So as long as there's no demand, uh, there was less need, you know, for them to provide that range of products. Uh, but, you know, if there is demand, they'd be more than happy to do so. Smaller enterprises, smaller establishments uh, were less able to do so, and they had multiple issues, as I mentioned earlier. Many respondents also questioned the sustainability of rewards, vouchers, and subsidies uh, associated with the war on diabetes and questioned, you know, what happens uh, thereafter, uh, you know, when the schemes and, for example, or when the vouchers and as well. So in discussion, we could see, you know, that there's a general sense of unity and purpose across all policy actors. Uh, in the context of war on diabetes, most of the respondents, you know, were aware of the trust of the policy and were able to understand and accept the arguments of this policy. Uh, we also saw, you know, that legal parameters and economic conditions were being debated at public consultations platforms, uh, and they were set in place over time. You know, words, images, symbols were used uh, to really produce winning coalitions with the policy actors. But we could also see that competing uh, perspectives contestations, if you like, you know, were, were rife, you know, among and across uh, the policy actors. You know, many of them questioned about whether war, a war should be waged against, against diabetes. Uh, and literature tells us that describing disease in terms of sage and war uh, or in the form of militarized rhetoric could backfire, you know, with unintended consequences. Uh, we had also, we also saw respondents with diabetes generally did not feel engaged by the policy. Uh, and I suppose here is where uh, 
uh, it underscores the importance of being clear on who the intended targets are uh, when it comes to policy implementation. Uh, why that's the case? Because you know, doing uh, you know, there are overt you know implications on the distribution of costs and benefits. You know, as it determines who gets what, when, and how. There were also concerns about the quality of messaging. Thus, highlighted the need you know to work on this area. Uh, our study also suggests you know that mitigating the high innovation, production, and marketing costs would be critical in this situation, and that would uh, require policy makers, especially policy elites, you know. Uh, to appreciate and understand uh, where you know the FMB industry players are uh, situated in the larger business ecosystem environment, uh, and and that's really because you know they uh, come with varying interests, paradigms, uh, operational concerns, and decision making processes uh, in the business community. Our study also suggests the need uh, to address the role of harmonizing accreditation for healthier products across countries, uh, which should be critical for the FMB manufacturers, especially. And how can this be achieved? It could be achieved perhaps you know, as what studies have suggested, you know, a political commitment uh, in the form of shared policies across governments to foster such innovation, you know, and to strengthen international partnerships to tackle diabetes as a whole especially in promoting developing healthier FMB products. Our study also suggests you know, the need to shift away from the dominant emphasis in research and policy on clinical management and behavioral change. Uh, it's important, you know, however, there's a need to also look at prevention uh, that's, that, that's based on or, should, or, or that's based on you know, uh, uh, you know, appreciating you know, diabetes as a condition, as a product of a complex system, and in large part being shaped by the FMB industry as well. Our study further suggests you know, the need to make uh, commercial determinants of health in relation to diabetes, in this case, explicit, and for the various policymakers to find ways uh, to work together, and especially the FMB industry, uh, to ensure policy coherence uh, in tackling the issue of diabetes. It's also important to address uh, the various segments of the policy actors, including the general public, especially those with diabetes, to ensure that their needs are clearly met. So in conclusion, our study has shown you know, that the war on diabetes policy has generated a sense of unity and purpose across uh, most policy actors, which is a really good thing in that sense. Uh, however, it's also illustrated you know, the highly complex environment in doing policy analysis. Uh, the policy triangle uh, analysis triangle has provided a sort of frame for us to look at the needs of the various uh, policy actors. Uh, it has also highlighted you know, the sort of implementation challenges you know, that need to be addressed. Uh, and you know, importantly, our study has also you know, suggested you know, the need to situate uh, the policy at the global stage and environment in order you know, for us to nurture the economic condition necessary for the FMB industry uh, to engage in innovation to formulate and reformulate healthy FMB products. So really, diabetes is a global issue and uh, it requires continuing efforts you know, to foster and enhance this collaboration and coordination across countries uh, in the management and prevention of diabetes. So with that, um, thank you very much for your time. Okay. Uh, uh, Jung, can you uh, start my video? For some reason, I can't start the video. It says the host stopped it. Sorry for, yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, it was really an illuminating discussion around the policy analysis and the pol politics around the policy analysis and an excellent example of how um, the policy analysis framework can be used um, in a setting very uh, close to us uh, in, in Singapore, uh, where most of our colleagues are working. So uh, thank you very much for uh, for taking this time. Um, so basically, I'll, I'll ask, uh, I mean, I uh, just um, uh, pose some of the questions that I received um, either uh, from our colleagues or uh, participants before uh, the workshop when they registered, uh, before this webinar when they registered, and also some of the questions came during the presentation. So I start with 
the questions that uh, we received during the um, registration process by our audience. So since John uh, talked much earlier and people might have forgotten your face already. <laughs> so I want to ask the first question to you. And also, uh, I don't want to put you on the spotlight, but the thing is, um, uh, you are the only, uh, I mean, practitioner who has a long career of um, uh, of practicing, uh, working with the policy as a policy personnel within the Ministry of Health in Singapore. So we received a, um, the question from somebody who asked, how to strengthen the relationship between academia and the policy world. I mean, you are in the in, in, in the academia now leading uh, the Center of Regulatory Excellence, also really, I mean, leading the policy core uh, in SDGHI. So, I mean, what's your uh, experience around this question? I mean, do you think it's, it's sufficiently uh, strengthened or do you think it requires more work? What are the, uh, what are the things that uh, we should do as academicians? Uh, thank you for the question. And let me add my thanks also to the speakers, really excellent presentations. Um, just to contextualize, I come from a regulatory policy background because I used to head the uh, Health Sciences Authority in Singapore, which uh, is really the regulator for, for uh, medical products and therapeutic goods, as well as the blood services and forensic services. Um, I think in the Singapore context, um, the whole uh, relationship has evolved over the years. Uh, there was a time, and in fact, that was one of the key reasons why we felt this webinar was important, uh, when perhaps the academic framework for policy development and analysis was not uh, perceived as so significant as having very uh, experienced practitioners coming into the picture. And of course, in Singapore, we've been fortunate over the years in the health ministry that uh, we've had very uh, uh, astute people, I would say, within the ministry, from the ministers and the permanent secretaries downwards, who've actually put together frameworks that have made a lot of sense and have moved the health system forward. Um, but of course, uh, as I heard what was presented today, and uh, I think from Lucy's presentation, and how Lai Meng has actually described its application of the framework, it just reinforced the point why it's important for policymakers also to have that framework when they are developing things. And in our particular context, in fact, we found over the years, increasingly the ministry itself has engaged academia quite significantly. Uh, so in fact, the uh, School of Public Health in the National University of Singapore, in fact, is strongly funded by the Ministry of Health to specifically look at policy issues. Um, and to help the uh, policymakers within the ministry formulate the policies and then surface them upwards to the senior civil servants, the deputy secretaries, the permanent secretary, the director general of health, then to the ministers. So I would say in our particular context, it's a very positive one. But of course, we can always do more and see more, which is partly why we are advocating uh, this particular webinar and these approaches, because my own sense is that uh, having a clear framework certainly helps, not only in the development, but also the assessment and analysis downwards. And what particularly struck me in Lai Meng's uh, presentation was that um, I sat through some of those early discussions on the war on diabetes, but the questions surfaced in your study are very pertinent. I mean, why use the term war, which uh, has this sense of uh, sort of categorizing people in different ways, and why uh, only sweetened products? So I would say they were probably thought through, but uh, if the framework perhaps had been applied prospectively, uh, in fact, the whole policy might even have been stronger. It's already been very effective as you described, but I would always say we can do more in this respect. And of course, from SDGHI's perspective, as we look across the region to low and middle income countries, um, I think this is even more critical uh, uh, and I think the rest of you probably have more experience in this and you could share something about this, but I would say it's even more critical in the context of low and middle income countries to have such a strong fundamental basis between the practitioners and the academicians. So that's my perspective, Tofik, and I'd love to hear what others have to say. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, anyone wants to add anything else? Uh, Lucy or Ayat or Lai Meng? Yes, I, I mean, I, I can do. I, I mean, I completely agree. I think that it's important that academics and uh, policymakers, practitioners work together and that each each can offer something to the other so that collectively 
there is both better understanding of past experience, but most importantly, consideration of how to move forward. I think that the ways in which we can engage each other, and I'm an academic edition vary from place to place. Great that the, uh, the, the Ministry of Health is, is drawing in academics. In other spaces such as mine, academics can reach out and um, both offer um, support, but also just engage until you get to know a policymaker's world. It's difficult to engage with it. So finding spaces to learn as the first step for academicians is, I think, important. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, I guess we move to the next question. Um, maybe, uh, I don't know, I mean, I want to pose it to Ayat, but I'm happy for anyone to um, take this question. So somebody um, asked, um, relationship, I mean, his question or her question was around relationship between systems thinking and policy analysis. So do you think any connection between these two concepts that, uh, that we hear a lot um in in the health system and health policy and systems uh arena you know the complex um complexity uh systems thinking um and its application in 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 policy analysis thank I hope you, you go? Yeah. yes thank you Sophie, and thank you for the question so uh i'd like to think of systems thinking as an approach uh and uh, a methodology and policy analysis is one of the tools that we can indeed use in understanding our health system, in understanding our policy being that health policy and so forth. That systems thinking being the approach which organizes our way to understand and better contextualize and then uh, develop uh, a better analysis of the policy indeed. So they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, Lucy, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I think that some of the um, insights of systems thinking are very similar to the insights in particular of bottom up theory. And that's the point where I've drawn uh, systems thinking and policy implementation work together because they're, they're both about understanding what a complex system is and how it um, how it works, really. So I think they are uh, mutually um, they are used together to mutual advantage. Thanks. Great. Uh, we received a good good number of questions in the uh, in the Q and A uh, box. Um, so many of these questions are actually directly targeted to certain uh, of our uh, presenters, while some are open. So the first question I can see on my screen is from Basira Basira Akhtar from uh, Bangladesh. She asked: uh, Informal actors and non-state actors have great influence on policy implementation. Most often, uh, they work closely with the street level bureaucrats. I'm interested to know their position in the policy analysis framework. What framework better explains their roles? So basically the role of uh, non-state actors and street level bureaucrats, how to integrate them in policy analysis. The question is basically around that. Lucy, you posing it to go. me, Tavik, yes. Um, uh, yeah, you, <laughs> you, you discuss the street level bureaucracy sure, and sure. others can. So yeah. I, I, the range of actors who are engaged in any element of policy process, including implementation, are manifold and I fully agree informal actors, non-state actors are important actors to consider. Uh, depending a bit what your question is, what you're particularly interested in, what you what the experience is, um, the, the policy analysis triangle would say identify the actors of most relevance to the experience of focus, whoever they are. Street level bureaucracy focuses on the frontline providers, but it's also been used in multiple ways. Um, and there is other bodies of theory that one could use to explore non-state actors, for example. So. Um, What's the concern? Who are the relevant actors? Everybody who's relevant counts. And that would include, as I see another question uh, suggests, uh, patients. Patients are obviously extremely exactly. important um, in, in implementation. Thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I had this question myself, actually, this patient thing, because, well, I was doing a policy analysis in Bangladesh on rural retention of physicians in Bangladesh. I was, I mean, I faced this question, whether to include patients in this uh, in this mix, do they have anything to say? Uh, or um, is it's just about the policy big issues? You just interview, key informant interview the policy people or not. So yeah, 
Um, so it, it, it's great, great you uh, you touched this uh, this issue. Um, there was another question to Dr. Lai Meng, if I remember correctly. Yeah, for the diabetes study, um, I have two questions. Were pharma companies included? Did those in different social roles differ in their views, criticisms of policies? Um, there was another question actually. What are the similarities and differences between policy? And, okay, that, that's, a, that's a different question. We can actually um, talk about that later. So uh, I, I uh, welcome Dr. Lai Meng. Sure, uh, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps uh, fairly straightforward to the first question. First, no, we did not include the pharma companies. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we, we thought that the, the more immediate policy actors to consider would be those that we listed over there. But yes, pharma companies uh, could be a group or a cluster of uh, respondents that we could approach uh, subsequently uh, in that sense. Yeah. And the second question, if I may just look at it, and that's uh, whether those in different social roles uh, differed in their views, uh, criticisms of the policy. Well, you know, I think uh, from our findings, you know, what we saw, you know, was that uh, the uh, state policy actors or the policy elites, you know, essentially, uh, it was very clear that it held a certain view, you know, and that was the policy will work, you know, and the, the policy speaks to everyone in that sense. Um, but we also saw that across, you know, the other you know, policy actors, uh, they were fairly consistent in, in their views, you know, that perhaps more could be done, you know, whether in this area of supporting those with diabetes or more could be done in uh, supporting, you know, uh, in, in other areas such as, you know, um, uh, facilitating, supporting uh, FMB uh, players, you know, uh, in innovation, yeah, innovation uh, production you know, of uh, more affordable, uh, healthier uh, FMB products. Yeah, so uh, they differ, you know, but uh, there were some similarities uh, across you know, those who held social roles, I would say. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is a little bit like maybe a little bit theoretical, but uh, perhaps uh, Ayat, if you are available, um, maybe you can take it or uh, Lucy or John or anyone can answer. But it's around uh, the similarity and differences between policy analysis and implementation science. So what are the similarities? What are the differences between these two, two fields, which are very closely related to health policy and systems research? Are they same? Are they different? What are the differences? Any thoughts? I'm happy to go first. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, please. So I, I, I mean, I, they are similar because they both have the word implementation in them. But as I understand implementation science, and it's an important field of work, it would you know, particularly focus on how to uh, strengthen interventions as they are implemented within healthcare settings. Whereas policy implementation um, stands back from specific interventions in specific settings to, to seek to understand the broader dynamics um, around um, implementation. And it isn't always about clinical interventions and um, improving their implementation. It's about understanding the context and the broader dynamics around them. And I think it is also about how collective action is taken, how people come together to work together to bring about implementation and health systems need people working together. Thanks, Tafi. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have another question for you, uh, Lucy. Absolutely. If I can add Oh, to yeah, that. yeah, yeah, please. Yes. please add. Sorry, sorry. Because I'm also a strong advocate when it comes to implementation mm -hmm. science. Uh, indeed, uh, echoing what Lucy mentioned and the need uh, of bringing interdisciplinary and multi-stakeholders together. So while building capacities and training on implementation science, we're very keen to bring a group of policymakers, statisticians, and researchers all together in order to, for them to have a better understanding and in order for them to better improve implementation on ground, absolutely, of health system bottlenecks as an example. Thank you. Over to you, Tofi. Thanks, Ayat. Uh, we have a, I mean, it's a long question, seems to be. Uh, uh, Lucy, you can see that, right? Uh, Which Nira, one Dr. Oh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Yes. Yeah. yeah, the yes, question I is, I mean, instead one. of like I'm reading it, it's better you... Mm. Sure, sure. Start discussing. So, I mean, I, I would agree that the current uh, global scenario seems a little bit dispiriting sometimes. 
Um, I think that uh, nonetheless, there is important in understanding the way the power dynamics are playing out to be ready for the moment when some um, engagement is possible. One of the things about policy analysis is it shows us that experience unfolds, that we have to take the long view, that we need to stick with experience and policy process to be able to influence them when there are windows of opportunities. Um, I personally, sitting in a South African academic environment, I'm not sure I can influence those global health moments, but others who may be colleagues or parts of my networks, maybe they can. Um, I think uh, that um, there is also a, a body of work that picks up on issues about power. And I speak of John Gaventer's work, which is particularly helpful um, in understanding other dimensions of power than those I've spoken about, and which was developed to support civil society in their engagement in local, national and global processes. So there's a lot of work we can draw from out there, but part of my message in this response is, um, things change we have to go along for the ride to be ready for when that window of opportunity comes thanks great thanks uh we are uh, almost at the like final moments of our um webinar but we got an interesting question from sarbani chakraborty um she said a systematic review of health taxes i've mentioned that one key element for policy success of health taxes is linking it directly to health benefits was this a policy factor in singapore was the government aware of the differential impact on large and small establishments since non-rich populations may access small establishments which impact social determinants of health? Maybe uh, Dr. Lai Meng or even um, John can uh, chip in to answer this question. Lai Meng, do you want to go first? I think it probably relates to your presentation, right? Um, <laughs> well, it says here health taxes or systematic review of health taxes. I meant, okay, well, um, well, in, in the context of Singapore, you know, I, I, I can't immediately think uh, in terms of uh, health taxes. You know, in fact, uh, many of the uh, uh, health services in Singapore are highly subsidized, you know, including uh, treatment costs, consumables, and, and all that, you know, in that sense. Um, well, I would imagine, you know, that, uh, you know, if, if you're talking about health subsidies, uh, health sub subsidies is a fairly uh, uh, dominant thing in terms of, you know, as a tool, as a policy tool to assist, you know, the general population and it's part of the universal health coverage as well. And, and you know, for those who fall through, you know, we do have a separate uh, pot of money, you know, which we call Medi Fund, to assist those uh, who are in need. You know, I would, I would, I would think, you know, that such kind of policies uh, could would have direct impact on uh, people's health, and um, and and the government, you know, to my knowledge, is constantly uh, monitoring, you know, the use of Medi Fund, profile of our patients, and and really their needs as well. Yeah. So the last part of the question, which is, was the government aware of the differential impact of large and small establishments? since excess small establishments right so i would okay in the context of singapore i would think that small establishment i would imagine that you know be referring to perhaps gps or some other healthcare providers or social care providers and in in that context you know uh, the health ministry you know works very closely with the uh, various uh, stakeholders and community as well uh, including the VWOs, you know, day centers and all and provide you know the sort of uh, subsidies you know for um, for, for the population, you know, that is, uh, you know, uh, financially in need in that sense. Uh, even for those who are not financially in need, you know, they uh, ensure, you know, that there is this um, uh, continuum of services, you know, to support them uh, in their needs. Yeah. So I think that's that's what I have to contribute to this question. Yeah, Prof. Thank you. The, the, the only thing I could think of in terms of the health tax would be something like the tobacco taxes that we implement. So that clearly is targeted at uh, constraining what would be viewed as negative behavior to control smoking. Uh, but even then, arguably, uh, it, the question is whether it's effective because the rate of smoking still continues to creep up. But I think, as Liming said, within our Singapore context, uh, it's more sort of rather than a taxation approach, it's more sort of uh, nudges to positive behavior. And in fact, the whole uh, move now within Singapore is this whole movement called Healthier SG, SG being a short form for Singapore, where the health ministry is working with the various stakeholders, including the family physicians, to promote preventive health upstream, 
uh, rather than dealing with uh, illness uh, at the end of chronic illness and disease. So I think that's the kind of philosophy that we're taking within our health system here. Um, thank you, John, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Lucy, um, Ayat, uh, Dr. Liming, and John, and whoever um, uh, was, uh, I mean, working behind the scene, and also the audience who were the uh, actually the heart of this uh, this presentation. Thank you so much. We are already one minute over time, but I think uh, this conversation should continue. I think this is a great opportunity to build uh, further networks, research opportunities, capacity building activities around health policy analysis in the future. This is just a beginning. Let's not uh, stop here. Just, I mean, consider this as a starting point for uh, further activities around uh, health policy analysis in Singapore, Western Pacific region, and uh, everywhere, everywhere. So I uh, want to thank you uh, once again uh, to everyone uh, present here, uh, who were present here, who are working behind the scene and want to uh, close this session for today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.